Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. On our 910th day together, we come back to the book of Revelation for Revelation chapter 2. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are faithful, wise, holy, and powerful. Your word speaks truth to us, shows us Christ, shows us our need, gives us your wisdom. So speak to us today through Revelation 2. Prepare our hearts to receive it as your truth and to respond to it in faith and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. To the church in Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp, two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny the, my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that he might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it that no one knows except the one who receives it. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, 
and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of their of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 2 contains the first four of seven letters within the book of Revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ dictated to the Apostle John written to these seven churches. So there are seven churches. These are real historical churches that were in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. They were all sort of located on, on, a, on a semicircular postal route, and they're addressed in the order that a delivery person would have encountered them on the delivery route. We think that the delivery method of the book of Revelation would have thus gone something like this. John writes out what the Lord gives him, seals it, and sends it to the seven churches. Well, the first church it's going to come to is the church in Ephesus. They would get the letter. They would copy it. They would copy it by hand. They'd keep that copy for themselves, and then they would send John's original letter on to the next church, which is Smyrna. Smyrna would receive the church, the, the letter. They would make a copy of it, and they would send it on to Pergamum, and so on. Each church, in order then, had a custom part of the letter that was for their church and the situation they were dealing with before it was sent on. Now, we know that the Colossian church was pretty close to this; these seven. We know there were other churches in Asia Minor who could have been included, but these seven were included, I think, for a very particular reason. Seven is a very special number. It's very important in the book of Revelation as the number of divine completion, the complete work of God. And so these seven churches are representative. They are real churches, and they really are being written about the real situations that they're dealing with in their own congregations. That's first and foremost. But these seven churches also represent the seven kinds of churches that are in the world throughout church history. So in a complete way, Christ, by addressing these seven churches and the situations they're dealing with, is writing comprehensively to the whole church throughout the whole church age. Now, some people, people who hold to a futurist view of the book of Revelation, would say that each one of these letters represents a, an era in church history, that Ephesus is the early church immediately after the apostolic age, that Smyrna is the church after that, etc. Um, I, I think that's very, very difficult uh, to do that. It's, it's, it usually makes for bad hermeneutics, bad interpretation of scripture. You usually end up trying to force things in church history to fit where they're not really supposed to fit. And it's almost always set up in a way that proves that we're living in the final age of the church before the second coming of Jesus. The problem is people have been doing this for hundreds of years, uh, ever since this futurist view sort of came into to being a, a few hundred years ago. So, no, that's that's not that that's not what we're told to do with these. We have no instruction that that's what's indicated here at all. Uh, so I think that's a bad way to handle it. Instead, I think we need to see them first and foremost about the actual churches that. John is really writing to, that Christ is really speaking to, and then as applicable to all churches at all times. I think always within the world, there are these seven kinds of churches. Now, the, the letters follow a particular pattern. You probably picked up on that. Uh, they always open with a greeting from Christ, and it's always the words of him who 
And then it picks up on some aspect of the vision of Christ that John had in chapter 1. First one to Ephesus, the vision of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. This means that he, he holds the angels of the churches in his hand and that he walks among his church. He's, he's, he's authoritative and present, authoritatively present among his church. And then Christ speaks of what he knows about the church, usually a word of commendation and then a word of correction. So he commends them for something that they're doing well, and then he corrects them for something that they're not doing so well. He then tells them that they need to hear, they need to listen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he promises them something for the one who conquers. And the way you conquer is by enduring, persevering in the faith. And in the case of Ephesus, the promise they're given is that they will eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So Ephesus being the first church, what are they commended for? They're commended for having sound doctrine. They test false teachers. And when they find them to be false, they don't put up with them. They are a doctrinally sound church. They are also a church that is enduring. They're holding fast to the truth. They're not giving in. They're not quitting. That's the word of commendation. What's the word of correction? They're leaving the love they had at first. They're abandoning the love. This is what I would term as cold orthodoxy. And cold orthodoxy is always dangerous because it is the first step on the slippery slope toward apostasy. To know Jesus, to love Jesus, to be warm-hearted and passionate for Jesus and zealous for the truth is what God wants for us. What happens oftentimes is that people continue to be zealous for the truth and very discerning and very passionate about sound doctrine, but no longer so passionate about Jesus, no longer so warm-hearted and tender-hearted toward Jesus and his mission. So the threat here is that if you don't repent, you're going to have your lampstand removed from its place unless you repent. Removing your lampstand means that your, your influence the, the light of the gospel that you're shining is going to be removed. So you'll be greatly diminished from having influence in the world around you. And yet there's a return to a commendation here. You do hate the words, the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans are mentioned several times. Who are these Nicolaitans? What did they believe? We don't know for sure, but we can piece together from these letters in Revelation that most likely the Nicolaitans are a group that teaches false doctrine and probably false doctrine that justifies the practice of eating food sacrificed to idols and also justifies the practice of sexual immorality or sleeping with prostitutes. Pretty bad, but that's, that's what a lot of these have in common. There's, there's those who have the doctrine of ba Balaam, there are those who follow Jezebel, the prophetess. These are kind of the three bad groups, right? The Nicolaitans, the Balaamites, and the Jezebelites. And what they all seem to have in common is that they're very loose morally. And they're teaching the church to be loose morally, to be compromisers with the world. And that is something that Jesus is strictly warning his church against. Now, there's a clever, uh, very helpful little PDF that I can show you that uh, lines up all these seven letters and the main elements that are covered may be very difficult for you to see. If you would like a copy of this in PDF format, you're welcome to email me. You can just shoot an email to pastor at foresthillpca.org and say, can I please have the PDF of the seven letters to the seven churches? I'll be happy to email you back and attach this so you can have it for reference uh, to review today's lesson and also get ready for our next lesson in Revelation, which will be a few days out. But you see, you have the church, Ephesus, the reference to one to seven, the description of Christ. He holds the seven stars in his right hand. He walks among the seven golden lampstands, the commendation. They have doctrinal uh, vigilance and endurance. The um, rebuke is the loss of their first love. And so the solution is you need to remember, you need to repent. You need to return to the works that you did at the first. The consequences of disobeying is that you would have your lampstand removed. 
And but if you conquer, you'll be given to eat of the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. So the next church is Smyrna. Smyrna has no negative rebuke and no consequence of disobedience. Notice Philadelphia also has no negative rebuke and no consequences of disobedience. The way to remember that is simply the fact that if you're familiar with geography at all, there are cities and towns that have been named Smyrna and Pergamum. There's a Smyrna in Georgia, there's a Smyrna um, in Delaware, there's a Philadelphia, of course, up in Pennsylvania. And when you're founding a town and you're coming up with a great biblical name for your town, you're not going to come up with Laodicea, which is the lukewarm church that's going to be spit out of the mouth of Christ. You don't, you don't name your town that, right? You name your town after something good. And so Smyrna and Philadelphia are the two good ones. And that's why if you go through this list, they're the only two that have towns named after them, not only here in America, but in other parts of the world as well. Um, and so that's just one way to remember the two good churches. But Smyrna is a very good church. They, they're suffering. Um, they're enduring serious persecution. And all that they're asked to do is to be faithful unto death. And when they do, they'll be given the crown of life. They're going to have to go through it. Notice God doesn't spare faithful churches from persecution. God doesn't say, well, you're faithful, so therefore you're not going to be per persecuted. That doesn't work that way. Now, Pergamum is an example of a church that's facing persecution and they're holding fast the name of Christ, and yet that doesn't let them off the hook. Just because you're suffering doesn't mean you're right. They're not let off the hook because they do allow false teaching. And Thyatira has a growing love. Um, they have deeds of service, but they lack discernment. So you can almost see Thyatira is almost the opposite of Ephesus. Ephesus is lots of light with no heat. That is lots of truth, but no passion. Thyatira, lots of love. Lots of deeds of service, very warm hearts, but lacking in discernment. So anyway, this little chart is a helpful overview of these seven different churches. Let's go back to our text and we'll move on to the church in Smyrna. Um, don't fear, they're told. Now this is, verse 9 has a very important doctrinal truth for us. It's very politically incorrect, but it's biblical, and we need to hold to it and understand it. And that is, Jewish people are not really practicing the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not really Jewish people spiritually. They're not. Um, because they deny Christ, you know, Jewish people will are allowed within Israel, within Judaism, are allowed to believe almost anything. There are Jewish people who are atheists, agnostic, non-observant. They're into New Age teachings. Um, there's a whole aspect of Judaism that kind of plays into New Age teaching. There are some who like Buddhism. But you cannot believe in Jesus. As soon as you believe in Jesus, they put you out of the Jewish community and they consider you no longer Jewish. It's the one thing that makes you no longer Jewish is by believing in Jesus. That's a pretty serious thing. So as politically incorrect as we have to say, we have to say, because they're rejecting him who is the true Israel, who is the fulfillment of all of the promises of God, who is the seed of Abraham and the seed of David, Jewish people today who self-identify as Jewish and who don't believe in Jesus, they're not really Jewish either, not spiritually. Um, and so they don't really have a share in the promises of God. They're referred to as a synagogue of Satan, because if you're not a child of God, Jesus made it pretty clear in John 6, if you're not a child of God, your child Satan's are in John 8, is that passage. Um, so the devil is going to throw some of them in prison. The devil is apparently, it's the Jewish-led persecution here in Smyrna. But God just says, be faithful. It's going to be limited, this tribulation, 10 days. That doesn't mean 10 literal calendar days. None of the numbers in Revelation are literal numbers. It's not like this is the persecution that's going to last exactly 10 days. One, two, three, four, five. No, 10 is a period that is limited, that's set by God. It's not seven because it's not the work of God. It's the work of Satan, but it's limited and prescribed by God. God's going to limit it. And what you need to do is be faithful unto death and God will reward you with life. The church in Pergamum, they're the ones who are, um, they're suffering. They've held fast the name of Christ. That's good, but that doesn't mean that they're perfect because they're tolerating 
some of these who followed the teaching of Balaam. What did Balaam teach? Balaam was the one who, you know, Balak had hired him to curse the people of God and he couldn't curse the people of God. He had to speak the truth. But then he tells Balak, hey, if you let some of your women go out there and seduce these people, they could probably draw them into idol worship. He knew human nature and it worked. And there was a great curse that came upon God's people during the Exodus because of this. And that was Balaam. This is the way that these people are teaching. They're teaching, hey, there's prostitutes around. It's normal. Everybody does it. Just go ahead. It doesn't matter. Well, all not only is that sexually immoral, it's sexually immoral. It's wrong, right? But in the ancient world also, all of those prostitutes were priestesses of a particular goddess. So you were engaging in false worship, worship of a false goddess, in addition to sexual immorality. That's not good. And there's also some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans, which um, probably also embrace some level of sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. They need to repent. They need to repent or God's going to come and make war against them. Jesus is going to come. He's going to come against them. And that's not good. And then the church at Thyatira, again, they're kind of an opposite of the church at Smyrna or the church at Ephesus, rather. Ephesus is lots of truth without a lot of love. Here they have love, they have faith, they have service. Their latter works are exceeding their first, right? The church at Ephesus is saying, return to the works you did at first. Hey, Thyatira is not only doing the works they did at first, but they're doing even better works. But again, that doesn't mean that they're right about everything because they've got a false prophetess in their midst. And what does she teach? She teaches the servants of God to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Jesus says, I've given her time to repent. In other words, she's been confronted by the truth. She's been warned. She's been given time to repent. And now she's going to be, she's going to get sick and she's going to die. And those who follow her are going to be thrown into great tribulation unless you repent. Again, the call is to repent. What do we get from these letters? Here's what we get. Christ is present, authoritatively present in his church, and he sees and he knows what we're doing. Some of what we do pleases him. Some of what we do doesn't please him. We need to strive to please our Lord by being faithful to him. Jesus is calling for faithfulness and perseverance. Hold fast to the truth. Endure suffering with patience and faith. And hold fast and don't compromise with the world. Don't give in to sexual immorality. Boy, we live in a sexually immoral culture. Unfortunately, so many Christians are involved in pornography or other sexually immoral things that are just a, the direct opposite of what Christ is calling us to be about. We need to pursue moral purity. We need to pursue separation from the things of the world that would drag us away from Christ. Because he has made us his and he's made these great and precious promises to us. We'll be given authority. We'll be given life. We'll be given a new name. We'll be given a share in our inheritance in heaven. But we need to hold on to Christ. And we don't need to be drawn away by the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. Would you make us a church that's like Smyrna and Philadelphia, a church that shines with your light, a church that loves you, a church that's faithful to you, a church that endures suffering with patience, a church that loves one another well. Keep us from being cold-hearted, lukewarm, or compromised with the world. And I pray this for every faithful church that is seeking to honor Christ. Would you strengthen us? Would you uphold us? Would you increase your grace to us to keep us faithful and grow us by your grace and for your glory? We pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that was Revelation 2. And uh, tomorrow, back to Jeremiah. Hope you have a blessed day in the Lord.